let's set aside the robotic tropes. Robots will rebel, robots are going to have a soul. Let's just imagine, for the sake of a thought experiment, that robots are always going to be loyal, they have no desires, no agency. Now, to be clear, I'm not arguing this is the case. I think computational-based consciousness might be possible, but for now, let's set it aside. Imagine that the USA builds hundreds of millions of humanoid robots, each roughly as capable as an adult human, a total of one robot per person. What would happen? Is this super far-fetched? Is this a crazy scenario? Brett Adcock doesn't think so, and he's CEO of a humanoid robot company that partnered with OpenAI. Those are the people who make ChatGPT. He thinks the hardware is ready, we just need the AI software. And AI software is improving at a truly amazing pace. Over time, I have a strong belief that every human will own a humanoid, uh, much like your car or phone today, where this robot will be able to do anything you, you want it to do physically. So experts think the hardware and software will be here in a few years' time. It's worth remembering that we did build hundreds of millions of automobiles during the 20th century. A humanoid robot would be less material than a car, so we have proven our ability to roll out products on this physical scale. Maybe it's not so far-fetched at all. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to robots, we've seen fakes, frauds, and flim-flam artists make humanoid robot claims since 1939. This is Electro at the 1939 World's Fair. If we're fooled into thinking that robo-servants are almost here, we'd not be the first. But still, let's imagine a world where there are as many robots as there are people. He set aside the dramatic robot horror stories, iRobot, uh, Will Smith, not the Asimov, Terminator, Blinky, Today, we focus on a more likely problem. Let's consider what functional, useful, non-Terminator robot technology does, but focus on who it does it for and who it does it to. Scenario one, everybody gets a robot. You get a robot. You get a robot. Everybody gets a robot. This robot is as capable as an adult human. You can send it to work instead of you. You can bring the robot to work with you and get your work done in half the time. Or you can work alongside your robot and double your income. Have your robot stay home and cook, clean, and maintain the house while you work. Need a big lump sum? You can sell your robot. It's utopian, I know. But what might this do for the economy? Consider. Overall, productivity could double. More stuff available on the shelves. Higher household income because twice as many workers per household. People can take loans against their robot's future labor. People get more leisure time. People could have a 24-7 caregiver and stay in their home longer as they get old. Young people could use the additional income or labor or child care to support new families. Who wouldn't like that? I'll tell you who. The people who lose in this scenario are exploiters. They have enough money that they can get desperate people to do unpleasant stuff for them. They can pay young women to do degrading sex stuff. They can pay young women not to tell the press when they run for office. They can pay artists and professional cut rate fees or pay lawyers to figure out how to avoid paying people entirely. They can pay assistants and underlings to accept their verbal and physical abuse. In a world where everyone has a modicum of economic freedom, it's going to be harder to find people willing to accept degradation. This world where everyone has a robot is the ideal outcome for everybody except exploiters. Everyone has more buying power. Corporations and their shareholders benefit from increased sales. General public benefits from more goods, lower prices, and more leisure time. Everybody wins who we care about. Here's the problem. Employers are aware of the situation. They know their employees are now capable of doing twice the work. They can say, do twice the labor for the same price or you're fired. And if half the workforce quits in protest, well, that's fine. Because the other, more desperate half of the workers will have to bring their robots to help. The increase in per-person productivity has been effectively captured by the employer. Sound familiar? Consider how this compares to women entering the workforce in the late 70s and early 80s households essentially doubled their work outside the home per family. Did household income double? It did not. Merely adding robots to the mix does not shift the balance of power. Even if we start with widely distributed robot ownership, it may not stay that way. Scenario two, same robots, but they're owned by corporations. At this point, the prospect of corporate-armed armies of robotic workers seems disturbingly likely. 
The problem with labor-saving machinery has been recognized since the Luddites wrecked looms in 1811. There's this old joke probably made up about how Henry Ford was touring an automated factory. Someone said it was a big improvement because robots don't take breaks or join unions. And Ford responded that, well, robots don't buy cars either. If we eliminate labor from production without support for displaced workers, support for their buying power, we create deprivation and misery. We end up hurting the economy that was supposed to benefit from the increased production capacity. In the situation where everyone owns a robot and can direct it to help them in their economic role, people can act as consumers. In fact, in their free time, they might consume more, driving up demand and using that spare robotic production capacity. In the scenario where corporations replace people with robots, it kills consumer buying power. It's not in a corporation's best interest to pay workers proportionate to their productivity. In fact, it's a classic prisoner's dilemma. Companies that hire humans can't compete with automation. But if everybody automates, there's no buyers and everybody loses. What can we expect under a full corporate automation scenario? Well, mass layoffs, lots of underemployment and unemployment, increased productivity, more stuff available on the shelves, but no buying power to purchase it. Flat or decreased household income, deflation, possibly a deflationary spiral, people get less leisure time because they have to compete for scarce work positions, assisted living homes become very profitable, automated businesses, young people have fewer babies because they can no longer find security or autonomy. Does that sound familiar? This is not just a fictional scenario that might happen if we get humanoid robots, it's happening right now. Artificial intelligence is a work in progress, but lots of kinds of digitization and automation are happening constantly. We see factory jobs automated and outsourced, ever more capable physical robots. We see call centers automated, outsourced to more capable chatbots. So what can we do about it? Cory Doctorow, who coined the amazing term in shitification, makes a great point. If a bully is taking your kid's lunch money, Doubling the lunch money will not help the kid. The bully will just take twice as much money. What can we do about automation transferring wealth to the powerful? What can we do to orient ourselves more toward scenario one, where everyone actually has control over their tech? I suggest that we need solidarity. There are three kinds of power. There's knowledge, capital, and solidarity. Knowledge is growing exponentially, but by itself, knowledge is of limited potential. Merely knowing how to automate something does not produce productivity gains. Knowledge plus capital can go much further, much faster. Knowledge plus solidarity can go a long way as well. What does that mean in practical terms? Now, not to get too political, but the FTC needs to keep working on fighting monopolies. They outlawed non-competes in 2024. It's a great step. They sued to get Amazon to stop stifling competition. The DOJ is going after anti-competitive policies at tech companies. They're suing Apple for allegedly blocking other companies from accessing key features on their iPhones. They could do more to block mergers and break up some of the big companies. But what we're doing right now is a start, and I'd like it to continue. We could go farther. The right to repair movement and uptick in union organization give me hope. Cory Doctorow suggests that the federal government could use procurement policies to demand interoperability and competitive compatibility, or ComCom. -com. That means that software and hardware have to play nice with other people's software and hardware, like how gun manufacturers can't make their gun compatible only with their own bullets. Well, they can, but the federal government won't buy from them if they do. These sorts of policies keep control over technology in people's hands rather than corporations. They ensure that it's us using technology rather than corporations using technology on us. Because the problem isn't really the threat of future robots. The threat is monopolized technology, the kind we have right now used against us. Thanks for listening. If you want to check out my last video, it's about burning iron. If you want to see my next video, do sign up, subscribe, or check out my mailing list. We will see you next time. Ah, uh, the cat tax. Can't, uh, can't go without this. Yeah, you're a good boy. Thanks for, thanks for waiting till I was done.